Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee will come to order. Today is Wednesday, April 17, 2024, and we do have a quorum present. <coughs> Members, we got two items on the agenda today. One is sort of an informational hearing on contract court interpreters relating to the judicial branch. Uh, and then we're going to take up Senate File 5337, which is our uh, Judiciary Public Safety uh, Appropriations uh, Bill. Um, it's informational, informational today, no action will be taken. We will take that up for final action on Friday. So we'll start with the contract court interpreters. Um, and uh, this is something which overlaps with our budget interests since there is a supplemental budget request uh, from the judicial branch that will affect the interpreters as well. Um, over the last year, there has been a significant amount of uh, 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 frustration and uh, difficulties in the judicial branch relating to the provision of interpreters uh, for constitutionally mandated services to make sure the non-English speaking uh, parties in the judicial proceedings um, have uh, are able to understand what's going on. Um, and so we have quite a few interpreters from a wide range of, of languages um, including ASL um, or sign language uh, to make sure that criminal defendants in particular are taken care of in the judicial system. Um, this led to uh, the, the, the frustration, uh, led to a uh, work stoppage uh, by a large group of contract interpreters, um, which uh, highlighted the issues in the judicial branch um, and uh, which also uh, caused a fair amount of disruption within the provision of uh, the justice services, uh, which uh, for me highlights the importance of, of the interpreters to make sure that justice is served. Uh, we are going to hear, uh, we have heard up to this point from the representatives from the judicial branch uh, relating to some degree to what's going on with regard to interpreters and their budget request. Um, and today we're gonna have an opportunity to hear directly from the interpreters. Um, I will call attention to members uh, uh, of the uh, committee that there is a letter uh, from uh, the judicial branch, the state court administrator, um, addressing these concerns. Uh, so that letter will be distributed at this time. Um, and we are going to hear from some interpreters now about uh, their viewpoint on what's going on. Our first testifier will be Marge Evans de Carpio. She is appearing remotely, and I believe she's on the screen right now. So. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, if you go ahead and state your full name and your affiliation uh, for us and tell us what you'd like us to know. Thank you, uh, Senator Latz and esteemed members of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. I am Marjorie Evans de Carpio and I have been a certified Spanish court interpreter since 2010. My colleagues will present concerns about the interpreter policy to you but before they do that, I would like to lay before you what it takes to qualify as a certified court interpreter. We are not simply people who can speak two languages. Before we can take the certification exam, we must first demonstrate that we have learned the ethics of court interpreting and pass an English exam, which includes legal terminology and slang. But the true hurdle is the certification exam, which tests the three modes of interpreting simultaneous and consecutive interpretation and sight translation. The standard is the ability to fluently speak both languages at the level of a college educated individual. I myself hold a master's degree. Although a university degree is not currently required to be an interpreter, it is not unusual for interpreters to have advanced education because not many people reach that level of language skills without it. In 2010, the year that I passed the certification exam, I was told that the pass rate was only 16%, meaning that 84% of people who believed that they could pass the test and spent time and money to take the test failed, 84%. The court setting requires a professional demeanor and the ability to carry ourselves with the decorum required we shoulder significant responsibility as justice for all parties involved, including defendants, victims, children, and other vulnerable people under protective orders of the courts. 
and litigants in civil cases. Justice for all of these people depends to a very significant degree on us doing our job accurately and honestly. We are the voice of persons who are express, expressing traumatic experiences, which we relay in the first person, conveying both the words and the emotions. This means that we are exposed many times every week to vicarious trauma. Moments later, we are the voice speaking legalese of attorneys or the judge or of an expert witness rattling off scientific terminology. Without the highly skilled and professional services we offer, there cannot be equal access to justice for any party in a case involving a person with limited English proficiency. Victims cannot have the clo closure that they seek. Defendants cannot defend themselves. Prosecutors cannot question witnesses or negotiate settlements. Children placed out of their homes cannot get the permanence they, they deserve and on which their futures depend. Interpreters play an essential role in the court's ability to provide equal access to justice. We facilitate communication among all parties, not just the limited English proficient individuals in a case. During the work stoppage, we were in communication with attorneys and the list of problems with unqualified interpreters is long and alarming. It includes an interpreter who struggled to simply set a date for a new hearing. People who were told they were being sentenced to forced labor when they were instructed to report to the workhouse. And a hearing abruptly stopped midway through because a telephonic interpreter could not handle the scope of work and simply hung up. The work we do is not for everyone. We have to become conversant in the specialized language of all kinds of professions, obviously the legal language of the court, the slang of some defendants, the scientific language of doctors and other expert witnesses, but also such unexpected things as the inner workings of a commercial freezer or the many kinds of bolts used in construction, anything absolutely anything can come up in a court case. Long story short, we are professionals in every sense of the word and deserve to be treated as such in every way. With that, I conclude my testimony so that you can hear from my professional colleagues regarding issues with the judicial branch's interpreter policy. Esperanza Lopez Dominguez, will testify about the importance of restoring the compensation rates in order to bring qualified interpreters back to court in higher numbers. I thank you for your attention this afternoon and for your work to ensure equal access to justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Evans DiCarpio. Um, I know you may have court to head off to, so um, I just want to ask at this time if there are any questions uh, for this testifier while we have you on the line. Not seeing anyone right now, so thank you. You're welcome to stay on the Zoom if you wish to uh, for as long as you can. Uh, all right, uh, next on the list then, um, we'll do Esperanza Lopez Dominguez, if you come on forward to the testifier table. And if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and your affiliation and tell us what you'd like us to know. Chair Latz and members of the committee, my name is Esperanza Lopez Dominguez. I'm a state and federally certified court interpreter in Spanish. I have 26 years of experience working in the Minnesota uh, court system. I would like to thank you and express my appreciation for the opportunity to share my concerns and some feedback um, regarding the work uh, interpreter situation in Minnesota over the past few months. You might have heard that there's a shortage of interpreters in um, Minnesota. And I'm here to tell you that there is no shortage of professional, highly skilled interpreters in Spanish in Minnesota. The issue is not a lack of interpreters. The issue is an enormous discrepancy that has kept, us, that has kept on growing over the years between the private sector and the Minnesota courts. There has always been a difference, and that's understandable. However, to retain the talent that exists in Minnesota, the Minnesota judicial branch will have to narrow that gap. Let me give you an example. So in 1997, in the mid-90s, the Minnesota 
um, judicial branch decided that interpreters needed to get paid $50 an hour with a two hour minimum every time that they went to court. So when we did a trial back then, we would get paid for an eight hour day at $50 an hour, which turned out to be $400 for that day. Of course, the private rates were higher and they were roughly around $75 per hour. So if we did a deposition for a private client, we would get 600 as opposed to the 400 that we would get in state court. In 2024, this is 27 years later, in 2024, the $50 rate is $65 right now. Interpreters are not getting paid the eight hours that they used to get paid in court. Now when we go to court, they say, well, we don't need you there until nine and you'll probably be done by 4.30 and we'll deduct an hour for lunch. So we will pay you 6.5 hours for a full day of trial in court. So we were getting paid $400 in 1997, 27 years ago. If we go to court, if I accept a trial that I'm offered tomorrow, which I have rejected, I will get paid $422.50 27 years later, that's a $20 difference in one day. The private rates have kept up with the pace. The private rates right now are anywhere between $130 an hour to $170 an hour. Let's take the conservative rate, let's take the $130 per hour. We get paid our eight hours for a full day at a deposition, for example. We also get paid for an hour of travel time within the Twin Cities. Eight hours in a private setting with the, with the one hour of travel time will pay us $1,170 for a day. Do I accept the job tomorrow for a trial at $422 or do I wait for my private client to give me $1,170? That's the big discrepancy that we're seeing nowadays and that, that's just a major discrepancy. Um, why is the private rate triple what the Minnesota Judicial Branch, uh, branch offers nowadays? Well. We all know that expenses have tripled in Minnesota since the 90s when we were getting paid the $50 per hour. I just moved here from Spain a year before that where I grew up and where I was born and I grew up. I specifically remember paying 99 cents a gallon when, uh, in Minnesota back then because it was three times or four times more in Spain, so it was very alarming to me. I have that in my mind, 99 cents a gallon. 27 years later, we all know how much we're paying and it's more than triple that. A two-bedroom apartment, the rent was $600. You can't find a two-bedroom apartment for less than $2,000 nowadays in Minnesota. And groceries, I believe, have more than tripled. At least my grocery cart definitely has. And I'm not asking for triple pay. We're not asking for triple pay from what we were getting in the 90s. We're just asking for the same purchasing power, which according to the Bureau of Inflation Statistics, their inflation calculator tells us that $50 in 1997 should be $98.16 in today's dollars in April of 2024. This might seem like a higher rate on paper for some, but let me explain to you what that truly means for an independent contractor court interpreter in Minnesota. The way this system is set up nowadays, when we get hired for a morning hearing, for example, we get paid for a two hour minimum. Let's say the hearing's at nine o'clock in Minneapolis, Hennepin, a typical place for us within the Twin Cities. The hearing's at nine, I leave my home at eight because I have to drive through rush hour, I have to find parking, I have to get into the building, I have to go through security. I have to go to the interpreter's office and grab the uh, interpreting equipment. And then I have to go to the courtroom and I look for the attorney if it's a complicated hearing or something that I'm not familiar with. I will have to find some records and read about the hearing. So I, I can't show up at nine o'clock at a hearing. I have to show up way earlier. The hearing ends at 11, I drive home, I have to grab my car. I get home by, by noon. These are four hours of my time that I've dedicated for this job. I'm not able to bill for anything else that morning because if I'm committed from nine to 11, I can't make it to another house before noon when the court sessions end until the afternoon. So if I'm, luck, if I'm lucky and I get offered another job in the afternoon, it will be the same thing, a two hour minimum, but I'm dedicating four hours of my time. I leave at one, get home at five. So basically, we're working eight hours a day and we're getting paid four hours. So that $98 an hour seems a little lower right now. It seems more like $45 an hour for us because we are truly dedicating an entire day. That's the reason why in federal court they don't pay by the hour, they pay by a half day or a full day. That's why many statewide, you know, state um, courts nationwide are paying half days and full days as opposed to the two hour rate. Like any other independent contractor, we do understand that we're responsible for the administration of the business aspect of our work and our own time, and of course, we're not asking to be paid for that part. 
but the overall trajectory of the payment policy and its terms has been downward for too many years now. When we did a trial, when we do a trial, in the 90s we were getting paid eight hours. Now we're only getting paid 6.5 hours for the same amount of time that we're dedicating to the courts. We used to get paid for travel time as of January 8th, with our new payment policy in 2024, interpreters will not get paid for travel time whatsoever. If I were asked to do a hearing in Worthington, it's three hours away from my home, I'm expected to drive all the way to Worthington, interpret there for two hours, drive another three hours home, and get paid for two hours that entire day, not allowing me to bill for anything else because I'm dedicating eight hours to the courts and I'm only getting paid for two. There is no way, absolutely no way, an interpreter is going to take any type of work in rural Minnesota or anywhere outside of the Twin Cities or their home area without getting paid for their travel time. For the judicial branch to retain the talent that it had in Minnesota, it must bring the purchasing power back so that interpreters can consider the MJB as a viable client. Personally, as much as I enjoyed working for the Minnesota courts for many years, I, have now, I, have, I now have to make the difficult decision on a daily basis to reject about 90% of the offers that I receive in favor of my more lucrative opportunities. I could never pay my mortgage, I could never feed my kids, pay my medical bills, or send my kids to college if I only relied on the um, income that the judicial branch generates nowadays. Clearly, the shortage of interpreters is directly tied in with the rate discrepancies and other provisions within the payment policy that negatively impact them. Interpreters will need to regain the purchasing power that they had in 1997 in order to make the judicial branch a viable client again. For the purpose of this hearing, the interpreter hourly rate will have to be increased to $98.16 as of today. That travel time will have to be restored. And so that we don't find ourselves in this position again, an annual cost of living adjustments should also be incorporated into the interpreter compensation policy. If you think that bringing the rates to $75 an hour is, has been talked about and requested by our court administrator, if you think that this is going to solve the interpreter shortage in Minnesota, I will say that it is a start, but I am afraid that it will most certainly not solve the issue. The MJB needs to fully fund the Minnesota Court Interpreting Program. Interpreters will continue selecting viable clients with competitive rates that unfortunately does not include doing business with the MJB and the Minnesota courts. They will continue accepting offers around the country from places with more competitive rates they will choose federal court over state court. They will choose conference interpreting over state court interpreting. They will choose to do remote work in Wisconsin, sitting from their homes in Minnesota instead. They will travel to Texas, to Oregon, and all over the country for better pay. And Minnesota will have interpreters on Zoom from other states telling defendants that they will be sentenced to forced labor, not the workhouse, but forced labor, because interpreters are being used from other states remotely when they can't find interpreters in Minnesota, and interpreters from other states are not familiar with our vocabulary used in our court system in Minnesota. We're not asking for you to bring the hourly rate to a private market level of $150 an hour or, or more, but you definitely need to get much closer than you are with the $75 an hour. Minnesota had no issues finding qualified Spanish interpreters in the 90s at $50 an hour. Pay them the same in today's dollars, that is $98.16 per hour, and you will get the same interpreters you had then. And honestly, if you ask me, I think I should be asking for a race. I've got a lot more experience. I've become federally certified. I've got lots of training. I've taught interpreting at the university. I'm a much better interpreter than I was 27 years ago. However, I'm not asking for a raise. I'm asking to, be get, to get paid exactly the same I was, paying, I was getting paid in 1997 when I was a newbie. That's all I'm asking for. Um, you will be hearing from our ASL interpreters as well. Uh, one difference that we have had in the Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota courts is that for some reason ASL was able to get a race throughout the years when we started at 50 an hour back in the 90s where spoken language went for 20 years without a race. I'm very happy for them and I think that that's the way it should have been. 
but I think spoken language should have followed them, and I think we should both be at the same level. We both do the same type of business, and they actually, with this new payment policy in 2024, their rates went down to pre-pandemic rates. So I believe they should they they join they join us in the request for the $98.16, which I believe is what should be happening. We should all be getting paid the same. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity for to be heard on behalf of all the Minnesota court certified interpreters. Thank you, Ms. Lopez Dominguez. Appreciate your testimony. Yeah. Uh, any questions from members of the committee at this time? All right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, Patty McCutcheon, we have also available on Zoom, I believe. Oh, she's in person. Excellent. <clears throat> Ms. McCutcheon, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you could state your full name. Good afternoon, Chair Latz and members of the committee. My name is Nick Zapko, and interpreting for me today is my trusted team and legal and certified interpreter, Patty McCutcheon. I With apologize. your permission. <laughs> for getting it mixed up as to who was testifying. Yes, it's me, Nick Zapko. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm a certified deaf interpreter. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, please. With your permission, I would like to speak on behalf of myself as a nationally certified deaf interpreter, but also my colleague, Patty McCutcheon, and my fellow working interpreters that are ASL certified by the National Organization of RID and your courts to provide access to approximately 400,000 deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing ASL users in this great state of Minnesota. Patty has an impressive 44 years of interpreting as a certified interpreter and working in your courts since 1998 when she moved here, which is equally impressive 26 years. I, however, have a lifetime of experience as a native American Sign Language user of interpreters, as well as an interpreter and mentor myself. I see and I know what access is and is not. I live in your hearing world that makes many assumptions about my language, my laxus, to my lack of access to information, trust me, I have lots of stories to share. But I am here because, as a court certified interpreter, I am seeing the fallout of the policy changes that have significantly impacted the people we serve, especially those in greater Minnesota. Now, I understand the cost of services. I understand the need to innovate with emerging technology, but we are seeing that one size does not fit all. The policy changes made by the Minnesota Judicial Branch, MJB, has incentivized the use of Zoom remote hearings that is not taken into consideration my highly visual, spatial, and 3D language that I use effectively as an interpreter in the courts. Now, deafblind individuals do not even have access to that video technology. How are they supposed to see when they have to be visually and physically engaged with the interpreter? Court rooms are situated to accommodate individuals, but not screens. MJB has made a policy to not permit me to be in person because they've cut any travel time. That has impacted my ability 
to communicate effectively with you here, but also in the courts. I'm asking the courts to reconsider their decision on eliminating travel time paid to interpreters. We're asking to provide in-person interpreters, not only in the Twin Cities metro area, but in greater Minnesota. ASL is a visual language. I understand your auditory world, but we need to make eye contact. We need to see the environment. We take great training and pride to understand the legal system, the terminology, the jargon, in order to be able to meet their language needs, whether the individual has language deprivation or deaf plus other communication issues, we encourage you, and we are encouraged to know that they are setting up, MJB is setting up an advisory committee to look at this and engage, but we're asking that we can be involved and at the table as frontline workers and give advice to the committee we want representation from others that are part of the court system, but we consider ourselves colleagues, a team, an officer of the court. We understand the barriers, and we understand how to get by that. We don't feel that MJB understands sign language like they have in the decisions they've made. And it's important to be a part of that committee to give them exposure, to give them education, and give rep representation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nick Zapko. Appreciate your testimony today. Do any members of the committee have questions? Senator Westland. Thank you, Senator Latz. Not so much a question as comments. And uh, I know for us as a committee this year in particular, where our t budget targets were so small, uh, I guess I won't speak for anybody else, but I know for me, I would certainly love for us to provide more funding to our court system. The interpreters um, provide such a valuable and actually ne necessary service to clients. I practice family law, and it is a matter of access to justice for an individual to be present in a court proceeding um, and then to have a barrier um, in terms of understanding the proceedings put in front of them is really unacceptable. So I do hope that we will have an opportunity maybe next year when we have a budget year with other targets. Um, I do hope you will come back. I hope you will continue to advocate on behalf of the court interpreters. It's a, it's. It's absolutely essential for the administration of justice, and I do thank you all for being here today. Any other comments from members of the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to testify in connection with this matter? Uh, so, uh, I'll follow up on Senator Westland's comments because this has been a source of great frustration for me too. Uh, any of us who practice law in the courts have seen firsthand um, how difficult and challenging this is. Um, I had a long conversation with an interpreter this morning um, who, because my client didn't show up, sat around for an hour and a half being available as he was obligated to do before he went across the street to the other Hennepin County Government Center building uh, where he was expected to be on several other cases. Um, and I've sat around mornings at the public safety facility with my client present, whom I could not communicate with at all, waiting for an interpreter to come over from the tall government center. Um, and when they weren't there by 10.30 or 11 because they were busy with other cases, uh, we simply rescheduled the court case, which meant that my client lost half a day of work, and we lost opportunity to resolve a case or make progress on a case as well. Um, and I'm, I'm part of a, a listserv of defense lawyers, anyway, that exchange these stories regularly, or worse. 
um, <clears throat> in their experiences. So this is a widespread problem. Um, it has been for some time. Uh, but I think it hadn't reached the level of understanding, um, at least uh, not among policymakers, um, about how, how much challenge there was in the system. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, there was a time eight years ago, maybe, when the public defenders came to us and said, we got a major shortage in public defenders in coverage and in rates of compensation. And we actually went on a six-year plan at that point over stages to catch up. Um, and we were able to do that over time. We just couldn't do it in one big leap. Um, and I think we're probably going to need something like that here, uh, just because we don't have the budget targets to make any major leaps now. Um, as we're about to hear, that at least for today and for open for discussion and consideration from the committee, is a proposal to go uh, is to not only pay for the uh, deficiency or the deficit in the courts for providing the increased services of interpreters that are constitutionally mandated. So they've, they've incurred the expenses, uh, not only to cover that shortfall, um, but also to increase the rate of compensation to $75 an hour. I understand that doesn't close the whole gap, and it may not be enough to bring people back. And, I, and we don't really, we don't have the uh, constitutional ability, I don't think, to mandate some of the other elements of how interpreters are managed in terms of uh, you know, remote appearance versus in person or travel time and minimum hours and so on. That's, that's uh, because the judicial branch is an independent branch under the Constitution. We provide the funding, but they manage their operations. Uh, and uh, I've also heard um, a frustration about a lack of communication between the interpreters, not only the, the uh, small proportion of interpreters that are employed full-time by the judicial branch, but the vast majority of the interpreters who are private contract interpreters. Lack of communication with them and the court administration over what the issues are, um, suggestions for improving efficiency and effectiveness, um, and so on. And, and I think there needs to be some bridge building and some trust building in there as well, and some intentional uh, reaching out and openness on both sides to have that communication, because I think the system will work better um, if everyone is talking and understanding what I'm seeing and more directly what the interpreters are seeing every day in court uh, as they try to make the system work. Um, so uh, what we do with our budget this year is going to be insufficient. And I'm sorry we can't do better. Um, if we can find a way to find extra resources, um, you know, certainly we will look at that. And, and uh, there are pressures all around the system. I can tell you probably every budget chair is, is pressing um, our leadership to find more resources for their particular, you know, budget silo. Um, but uh, I'll do my best, and I'll do the best with what we have for this year. And, and uh, I'm thinking long term in terms of how we can improve the overall compensation system as well. So does anything that I've said caused any members of the committee to want to add anything or have any questions or discussion? We'll open it up. Anyone else in the room want to testify in connection with this? All right, well, thank you, uh, all of you, and especially the interpreters that took time away from your regular schedules to come here and be here in person or on Zoom. Appreciate it very much. All right. And now we're going to go to the other item on the agenda, which is the presentation of our proposed budget. And for that, I'm going to hand the gavel to Vice Chair Umu Verbetten and uh, Mr. Turner, our fiscal analyst, and I will go to the testifier table. Whatever she is.
Senator Latz, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I guess I've already laid the foundation for the challenges that we face. Um, but let me be a little bit more explicit about it. <clears throat> uh, we were given uh, targets that were split into two silos, and we were told very specifically we cannot take money from one siloed target and use it for appropriations in the other siloed target. So we have our judicial branch target and we have everything else, Department of Corrections, Public Safety. Um, and uh, Mr. Turner is gonna walk us through the spreadsheet um, and uh, relevant pieces of the uh, proposed delete everything amendment. Today we are going to present it, have conversation about it, take testimony from anyone who wishes to uh, be heard on the matter, and then I anticipate that we will be taking action in our committee meeting on Friday. <clears throat> um, I will say that I'm grateful to the leadership for giving us the target that we got, but I'm frustrated that it's not sufficient to meet the needs um, as we perceive them uh, within the system. Uh, the targets were split between one-time appropriations and tails and as Mr. Turner will explain, especially in the judicial branch, our tails are extraordinarily small. We've found a way to work around them for a little while, but that also hampers our ability to make uh, uh, structural investments um, in, in long-term costs like employee compensation or contract or compensation. So with that, um, I think what we'll do is let Mr. Turner kind of walk us through it, and I will interject um, as I think it's helpful uh, on each of the uh, parts of the presentation Mr. Turner makes. Madam Mr. Chair. Turner. Madam Chair and members, <clears throat> uh, Senator Latz said um, our uh, total budget target was split into two sub-targets. The total target for judiciary and public safety was 59.3 million in fiscal year 24 and 25, and 17.22 million in 26 and 27. But the sub-targets are as follows. Uh, in judiciary, we had a $36 million target in 24 and 25, and a $3 million target for 26 and 27 tails. And seeing as how uh, judiciary spending is basically personnel and carries tails, that created a problem. Uh, then we move on to the public safety sub-target. Uh, it was a bit more balanced. It was 17.9 million 24-25 and 14.22 million in 26 and 27 entails. So uh, we have one budget and one spreadsheet uh, we're tracing or we're, we're tracking two different targets. I track them at the bottom of the sheet and you can see um, the tail targets listed on the last two lines of the, of the spreadsheet. But if we started on the spreadsheet, uh, we'll start with the Supreme Court, line three, uh, court cybersecurity. The bill appropriates 5,250,000 in fiscal year 25. Uh, the bill, which we'll get to, um, the appropriation language makes that available until June 30th, 2027, which means the bill appropriates the equivalent of $1,750,000 each year for three years, for 25, 26, and 27. You'll see that in three other places on the spreadsheet. We move to line four, safe and security courthouse grants. We have a one-time uh, appropriation of $500,000. Move to the district courts. First two lines are for psychological services. The first line is the deficit that the court is carrying for um, forensic examiners. Um, the bill appropriates five million three hundred and seventeen thousand and twenty-four for that purpose, and fifteen million nine hundred and fifty-one thousand and twenty-five. The bill makes the the appropriation in the second year available until June thirtieth, twenty twenty-seven. So once again, uh, it's the equivalent of appropriating $5,317,000 each year for three years. Madam Chair. Senator Latz. 
Um, <clears throat> if I could amplify a little bit there uh, for those who aren't as familiar with this. Uh, psychological services and psychological examiners are constitutionally mandated services for uh, mostly criminal defendants who present to the court either with mental health issues that might make it impossible for them to effectively participate in their own defense um, or with indication that mental illness was responsible for um, the conduct that led to their criminal oh. charges. Yes. Um, I can take a shower before you do. Mm -hmm. um, criminal defendants do have a right to ask the court for an evaluation uh, from a professional, a, a, uh, a professional examiner to make a recommendation to the court for a judge to determine whether or not under either Rule 20.01 or Rule 20.02, that defendant um, ought to either be, uh, whether the case ought to be paused because they can't competently participate in their own defense until they are, until they attain competency. And some of you may recall um, in the last uh, year, we, we passed um, a comp what we called originally a competency restoration board, but. Um, the name change this year to be the competency attainment because we don't always know if they if they were competent so restoration would suggest that they were once were and can be again um, attainment just means whatever whatever level they've had in the past they're not competent right now they need to attain it in order to proceed with the case um, or uh, in the case of a 2002 evaluation whether or not the defendant um, has what what uh, in, in the old law school case law used to be called the Monoton uh, rule, basically uh, not held criminally culpable for their conduct because it was they didn't know at the time of the conduct that what they were doing was wrong because they were in the throes of a mental illness at the time. Um, and uh, ultimately that can be something for the finder of fact uh, to make a determination on either a judge only or a jury, however the trial is conducted. Uh, but uh, they're entitled to a recommendation from a professional evaluator, and that's happening more and more often. Um, I've seen more in my own private practice in the last two years than I did in the, in the 27 years before that that I was in private practice. Um, and I know my experience is not unique. As I mentioned, I'm on a listserv with defense lawyers. We're all talking about these things. Um, and the courts are seeing it as well, and, and that's why you can see the uh, the deficit um, that uh, has been incurred by the courts. Uh, they're paying the examiners to do a whole lot more work than they used to, um, and uh, it's got to be funded. So that's where we're at with that. Uh, and then the next line, Mr. Turner will talk about, has to do with their rate of compensation. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Madam Chair, members, uh, line 11, psychological examiners, uh, a pay rate increase from $125 an hour to $138 an hour. That's approximately 10.4%. Um, that uh, costs out at uh, $1,203,000 in 25 with straight tails of $1,203,000 in 26 and 27. Madam Chair. Senator Latz. Uh, to that, uh, the, the courts uh, requested an increase to $225 an hour uh, to basically chump, try to get into parity with what similarly qualified examiners are getting paid by other government agencies like the Department of Human Services. Um, the courts are way behind in the rate of compensation. Um, and similar to the interpreter testimony that we heard, it's harder to get examiners to continue to do the work at a much lower uh, rate of compensation compared to their alternatives. Um, so again, we make a very small step here, not nearly adequate to the task, but it's what we feel we can do within this limited budget. Mr. Turner. Madam Chair, Madam Chair members, uh, then we'll, we'll move to the two court interpreter lines, 12 and 13. The first is the court interpreter deficit. Uh, the bill appropriates 1290024 in 
and three million eight hundred and seventy thousand and twenty five. The appropriation in the second year is available until June 30th, 2027, once again, uh, which means the second year appropriation is the equivalent of appropriating $1,290,000 each year for three years. Then line 13 is the court interpreter rate increase uh, uh, from 65 to $75 an hour. That's approximately 15.4%. Uh, that costs out at 235,025 and with tails of 297,000 each year in 26 and 27. Well, Madam Chair. Senator Lotz. This way of budgeting is not the preferred way of doing it. Um, we did it a little bit last year. Um, I don't think we have a choice this year um, the downside is that it creates a fiscal cliff at the end of 27 um, because it's not built into the base. It's one-time money that's made available <clears throat> over a three-year period um, without supplemental or additional funding into the base, at least to that level, when it's budget time next year. Uh, to look longer term, um, then uh, there's going to be a drop back in the availability of funds. Um, I figured that at least we can get some short-term compensation increases out the door, um, and uh, it will help. Um, and uh, I personally am committed, if we have the, uh, the, the public resources and the political wherewithal to focus on longer term solution, at least at that level. Uh, obviously, I'd like to go higher than that to start closing that gap that we've heard about, uh, frankly, on both lines for the examiners and for the interpreters. Um, but at least for now, I think this is the best that we can do, but I think it's something that we ought to do, even if it puts us in a little more awkward position in the longer term budget forecast. Mr. Turner. Madam Chair and members. We move on to line 14, the jury program deficit. Um, the bill appropriates 20,000 in fiscal year 24, which is basically a remainder after we'd funded uh, the rest of the judicial budget. Uh, the main appropriation is 2,364,000 in 25. Uh, once again, it's available for three years. It's the equivalent of $788,000 each year for three years. And that's it for the courts. Uh, move on to Department of Corrections. Line 20, the operating adjustment. This is the governor's request. 5,900,000 uh, the first year and uh, 5,900,000 5, 5, the first year and 2 million the second with tails of $7,110,000 each year. Uh, the way I've got it broken out here is uh, we have a the Senate has Senate file 4312, uh, firearm safe storage. In the Finance Committee, it carries a cost of 10 million in the, or 10,000 in 25, with tails of $19,000 each year. Um, the spreadsheet is carrying that cost. So I've, I've broken out the total uh, appropriation to corrections to the uh, 5,900,000 online 20, uh, 1990, tails of 7091 uh, each year, and then we carry the safe storage bed cost in the following line. And it comes to a total of the governor's request for the Department of Corrections. We move to the Department of Public Safety. Um, these are all OJP, uh, Office of Justice Programs initiatives. On line 27, we have Crime Victim Services, which was the governor's request uh, at $9,200,000 one time. And we have Senate file 4258, report on preventing violence against Latina women and girls, a Senator Westland bill, I believe, is $250,000 one time. Uh, Senate file 366. Just for the record, that's Senator Mann. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, then we have uh, Senate File 3662, J 
juvenile crime reduction grants. Grants. I hope I get it right this time. I think that's Oma verbatim. Uh, $500,000 one time. And then Senate file 5243, among American Mediation Center, Senator Her, $50,000 one time. Then we have uh, kind of some housekeeping here. The Clemency Review Board uh, is the governor uh, recommends that it break away from the Department of Corrections and become an, an independent entity. And what the governor did in his bill and the chairman concurs in his bill is uh, he appropriates $986,000 in 25 uh, and carries the 26 and 27 appropriation as well to the independent clemency review board. And then on the spreadsheet that in order to do that, uh, for it to be budget neutral, you've got to cancel that general fund money from the Department of Corrections. Uh, it nets out at zero, but what it does is it detaches the clemency review board from DOC and establishes itself as an independent uh, agency or entity. And uh, Madam Chair and members, that's the budget. That's the spreadsheet. Um, If you look, if you want to look at the bill quickly, um, the body of, of the bill pretty much implements the spreadsheet, so don't really need to go over it. Uh, it also includes the budget-related provisions of Senate File 5337 as introduced, which was the governor's uh, budget bill, which you heard last week. So. These provisions have been discussed in committee. If you, if you want, I can go over them quickly, but would you prefer that? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right, like I said, sections one to six of the bill explain uh, the appropriation format of the bill and appropriate money to the four agencies, um, DPS, uh, Corrections, the Judiciary, and the Clemency Review Commission. And we have section seven in the bill authorizes urban search and rescue and the Minnesota Air Rescue Team to receive reimbursements from the non-responsible party fund. This is from the governor's budget bill. Sections eight and nine uh, reflect that cancellation that I talked about uh, from the Department of Corrections so that the Clemency Review Commission can set up as an independent agency. Um, section 10 is the implementation language for uh, the Senator Mann bill, Senate file 4852, which requires the Commissioner of Public Safety in consultation with Esperanza United to develop a report that provides preliminary research and recommendations to reduce, prevent, and end violence against Latina women and girls. Uh, section 11 is the impl implementation language to Senate file 3662 authorizes the Commissioner of Public Safety to issue grants to Anoka County, Hennepin County, and Ramsey County, to issue sub-grants to community organizations or community-rooted programs to provide intervention and support services for youth who come in contact with peace officers and are suspected to have committed a juvenile petty offense or delinquent act. It's a long sentence. Um, and then it has a reporting requirement. Uh, Article two, as the public safety article. <coughs> Section one defines state emergency response asset for the purposes of the Minnesota Hazardous Incident Response Team or Act. Section two defines urban search and rescue as a multi-hazard discipline that involves the location, extrication, and initial medical stabilization of victims trapped or missing because of a man-made or natural disaster. And Section 3 authorizes the Department of Public Saf Safety to use up to 10% of the biennial appropriation for the Youth Intervention Program grant within the Department or within the Division of uh, Office of Justice Programs for administrative costs. Uh, current law caps administrative costs for that program at 2%. We move on to uh, Article 3, it's, it's Corrections provision, or Department of Corrections provisions 1 through 5. Uh, Commissioner Schnell explained last week are related to the Minnesota Rehab and Reinvestment Act. Um, the Earned Incentive Release Program we enacted last year. Uh, the changes in these provisions clarify that the same incentives are 
for those individuals serving supervised release terms will also apply to those who are subject to a term of conditional release. Uh, section 6 updates community supervision funding formula to include the appropriation of MRRA savings to CCA and non-CCA jurisdictions providing supervision services. This was omitted in last year's rewrite of the CCA um, statutes. Uh, section 7 defines conditional release for the purposes of MRRA, a technical addition. Section 8 removes the executive director of the Cannabis Expungement Board from the salary requirements of Chapter 15A. Section 9 does the same thing for the Clemency Review Board Commission. Uh, Section 10 extends the transition period in which the DOC provides administrative support to the Clemency Review Commission, which is becoming independent from February of this year to June 30th of this year. And finally, Section 11 extends the transition period in which DOC provides admin support to the Cannabis Expungement Board from March 1st of this year to August 1st of 2024. And that's the bill, Madam Chair. Thank you for the walkthrough, Mr. Turner. Um, just to clarify, we're doing the walkthrough today. We can um, take some questions from members, but we are going to have testimony and um, <coughs> amendments on Friday. Other questions? Okay. Senator Latz, final words? No. Wonderful. Let's announce... Friday's here. Yeah, we are meeting uh, next Friday, April 19th at 9 a.m. in MSB 1200. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Latz, uh, as we uh, conclude, uh, in anticipation of Friday, uh, do you have any plans to add any policy bills to this particular bill on Friday? Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, no. In keeping with the Senate's practice, we will not be adding pure policy to our budget bill. Uh, we know we're going to have to confront that question with the other body, which has a habit of not doing that. Um, but uh, we will remain consistent. In my judgment, it's not a good idea to try to mix pure policy decisions with budget negotiations. Agreed, Senator, Senator Limmer. Latz. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, with that, committee's adjourned. Okay. Nice.